uh, as I said earlier on. Um, Sarah is the youngest Secretary General of the uh, Muslim Council of uh, Britain, um, and she's the four first uh, woman in that position. Uh, I have worked with her on several occasions, including uh, in the survey of um, online uh, anti-Muslim hate speech that we conducted last year. So the floor is yours, Sarah. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, today. Assalamu alaikum. And uh, really quite an honor to be amongst your excellencies, notable delegations, the Council of Europe, um, and to have listened to so many of the important reflections. Uh, when Daniel and I were speaking, uh, and I wanted to share something with you all, the consideration was less about what is the problem, because we talk a lot about that, is but more about what we can do from about the problem, learning from grassroots organizations and national bodies. So for those of you who aren't aware, um, last year I made history um, as and was elected the first female, the youngest and the first Scot uh, to represent the Muslim Council of Britain as the Secretary General in its 25 year history. And the reason I bring that up now, it's been a year and six months, is that in that first week and that first hour of being elected, it created international hysteria. And the world was a little bit confused as to how could Muslim communities, predominantly men and imams and mosques, elect a young 29 year old to be the most senior Muslim representative leader in the country. So my phones were jammed. Um, and whilst most of the media was very positive, there was a very distinct negative and far-right narrative that stereotyped me again. When we're talking about this anti-Muslim hatred, it permeates in all spheres of society, all the way to the top. So I was regarded as a puppet. I was regarded as a, a pleasant face away from a cross-eyed bearded man. Um, I was told that I wouldn't really be in charge and more or less I was a token. So obviously that's not the case and I'm very much the boss. <laughs> But the point being is that there was already a narrative that just couldn't accept Muslims being diverse, Muslims realizing that actually there was a change that they wanted and Muslim men voting for a woman. And that is what we achieved last year. And when I came on board, I realized you know, very quickly that the media, whilst they were interviewing me that first week, it became less about my position and more about everything about Muslims. Do you think it's okay if young girls don't wear the headscarf? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? I said, I'm not the FAQ and everything Muslim. What do you want from these questions? And most notably, I had a very famous interview on Radio 4. I'll let you look at that in your own time. But again, it was very hostile. It was only day four of my election, and yet again, I was being met with this hostility. And I thought to myself, really is this what it's still like in, in 2021 at that time but the course of my leadership is to be different and that is what we've been doing for a year and six months which is whilst that narrative is there whilst the guise of 9 11 and 20 years of it is still there what can we do to facilitate positive partnership building and community contribution and when the pandemic hit and COVID 19 was seeping all over the world we had 44,000 Muslims in the National Health Services providing care and support. Of the first five to six that died were Muslims. We had people all across the front line, and we even had community groups that said if it wasn't for the mosques, the churches, the synagogues, and the temples, we would not have eaten because we didn't have anywhere to go. And so the value of faith and, their con and our contribution is immense. The difference we're making is already happening. And so I said, as a young leader, what did I want to represent? Well, number one, it's about diversity and inclusion, both within our societies, but also broader. And so what I found is that there was a huge interest from the corporate sector, from politics, from all over to say, well, we want to engage more Muslim communities. How do we do it? And I said, well, are you talking to civil society partners? Are you talking to representatives? How do you engage with communities? And what we found was that actually, whilst there was a lot of talk about engagement, very much little, it was you know, refined to a diversity week. But one of the best examples that we have of positive engagement for change is our Visit My Mosque program. 
So before the pandemic, we had 250 mosques across the UK open their doors to the general public and say welcome. And as a result, we had neighborhoods, friends, communities. I personally volunteered at one of the mosques and this uh, a couple a family came in and said, I've walked by this mosque for 28 years and I've never come in. And today I'm bringing my kids and I can't believe it. It's lovely, <laughs> you know? And, and so the point being is that the policy side is really important. And the definition is something that we say is really important because to this day, some people will say Islamophobia doesn't exist, but fundamental is implementation. And there has to be a civil society partnership. I always say to people, Islamophobia is not a Muslim problem. It is a societal evil that can only be tackled when all of society takes responsibility for it. So if it's just a Muslim issue, how are we going to move forward? And so what the Muslim Council of Britain is keen to do is facilitate Muslims participating in public life. So as I've been speaking to political parties, I've asked them, what engagement are you doing? How are you facilitating a conversation? Did you know that 50% of British Muslims are under the age of 25? That's a very young population, over 3 million. So 50% of the people I represent are young people. And guess what? As, like myself, third generation British Pakistani, we're not interested in all the old stuff. We're not interested in the narratives and the way that we've been defined. Actually, we're stepping forward to the table saying, well, we want to do something. We want to be in tech. We want to be in science. We want to be political representatives or journalists. But we are being framed still as this other. We are being created as this suspicious alien. But actually, I'm born here, and this is where I belong. You know, So that narrative needs to change. The MCB Center for Media Monitoring conducted research into tens of thousands of articles in the media and found that 59% of everything that was written about Islam and Muslims was negative. And there are people that have never met a Muslim, so their reference point is that. And all of the incredible work that's going on, let's talk about Ramadan. So this Ramadan was brilliant because we could finally meet. And I was very lucky enough to be attending iftars across the country. And I found myself, Arsenal Football Stadium is celebrating Ramadan and hosting an iftar. The Lord's Cricket Ground, the Lord's, the Lord's Cricket Club, the long room, very, very historical outfit. Here we are, the call to prayer, Muslims, wider community, everybody is celebrating Ramadan together. All across London, Trafalgar Square, tens of thousands of people were celebrating Ramadan, open iftars, people were sharing food. Did it matter what religion you were? No, because people felt the spirit of the month and the idea that yes, we can come together and learn something because that's the best way to tackle what we're talking about. If it's based on fear and negativity, you only get more of that. But underpinning all of it is, an under, is a misunderstanding, misconception, and a fear. We fear what we don't know and what we don't understand, as well as, uh, as some groups who perpetuate hatred because it fuels whatever it is. And what we see from in the European example, even the British example, is political point scoring at the expense of Muslim communities. You know, it's, it's, it wins votes. And so I would say that our call to action, our responsibility is to really understand the impact of that on visibly Muslim women in particular, but also on young people and their identity and their opportunity. <laughs> and as a very proud British Muslim woman myself, and as someone who has taken on this role, and I talk about being proud is that I see a world and a vision where actually, as a young British Muslim, you can achieve anything you want. That should be the status quo for Britain, for our institutions, for our country and for our society. And so the initiatives I spoke about, they require partnership building, but also a willingness. And I think that's really the question to all of you in the room, our decision makers, our ambassadors, our countries, our states, is, is there a willingness to change? If we reflect and we look within ourselves, are we willing to take the next step that is required from us to change something? Because if we allow anti-Muslim discrimination or hatred of any kind to fester, it will cripple all of our society, not just one part of it. And we've seen this in history. It might be Muslims today, it'll be another community tomorrow. But what good is our society if we're not all benefiting? 
So thank you so much for listening and I welcome questions and I really thank you for the opportunity.